Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome everybody to a new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we are coming at you with a new B sides episode of the band the hotelier which formerly, you know, Hill, formerly the hotel year the, the hotel year which actually tyler do you know what the fuck that's all about because i sure as fuck don't so i think the, it was that they just thought it was dumb and they changed it <laughs> they, they were originally called the hotel year uh and then there was another band that had a very similar name I can't remember exactly what it was, but it included the word was hotel the, year. The hotel month. <laughs> no, it included no, the word it, hotel year and something else. And so they just changed it to the hotel year, which obviously is, um, you know, uh, homophone, something like that. One of I those have no idea, honestly. I just oh. when, when it sounds the same, but means yeah, something different. They're, they're quite liberal. They ain't no homophobes. <laughs> what well, <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in um, Kentucky. Um, I, I guess it's like, as just a background, I think it's fair we say up front that this is a, a band that means a whole lot to the three of us, just mm-hmm. individually and also in a connective way, as, as I will get to with an album here later. But this is a very, very special episode in many regards to, uh, to us specifically. Yeah. Definitely. So um, this is a band based in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, I believe. Um, so Massachusetts emo revival band. So they kind of, um, as we'll kind of discuss, their first album is kind of more pop, pop punk than emo, but they very yeah. quickly um, kind of uh, sort of became known for their particular brand of, of emo revival music and and it's fair to say that their second album home like no places there is one of the most well-known and beloved of the emo revival albums of the last decade um so yeah very very significant uh album for that kind of history of of that kind of subgenre. um yeah but they only have three records to date it's not clear whether there will be a fourth or not um i got uh, the impression that there wasn't gonna be but i may be very wrong yeah, front person Christian Holden has been coy about whether there is going to be more music from the hotelier. We just don't know. Um, it, it seems to me uh, very much as though they're, they, with their final record, Goodness, which um, I will be talking about at length, as considering it is my favorite album of all time, very much put a stamp on on the hotelier as a as a musical project. So it's it, yeah. obviously it wouldn't surprise me if, if Christian and the other members of the band continue to make music, but perhaps it would not be under this particular name, but who knows? Just, maybe, just, maybe there will be more. Just so long as they're doing something. Yeah, exactly. I need, I, I need more. Exactly. I certainly feed, would like more. Feed me more. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I would like to say up front, because um, we're, I'm going to be talking, I'm presumably all of us are going to be talking about the writing of front person Christian Holden at length as well. Um, so Christian has spoken in a number of interviews about uh, how a Christian is a queer person and a person who is gender questioning. Uh, the, in the inter- most specific interview I've read about this, which was from 2014, uh, they identified as cisgender male, but um, I don't have any kind of, definitive record of whether they have preferred pronouns or not. Uh, Some interviews slash blog posts slash um, things that I've read use he, him pronouns. Some use they, them pronouns. I'm going to use they, them just because that's um, what I feel comfortable with. But my understanding is that I don't know that there is a preference, certainly not one that that Christian has made on their Twitter page or anything like that. So presumably either or is fine. Um, but just uh, I will do my to best you. to follow in this stead just because I, 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 um, I, I've only known Christian in a very singular context and I've only just recently found this out. Yeah. So it's just something we want to put out there at the front so that uh, our listeners who may be fans of the hotelier uh, are aware that we're aware, you know, of this um, yeah. particular aspect. Cause I'm going to be talking about like, um, cause in terms of lyricism, like uh, 
Christian uh, in a lot of their records appears to write from a very personal place. Sometimes it's not clear the extent to which it's, it's based in reality and the extent to which it's fictionalized. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of personal uh, aspects to their music. So it, it only seems right to be um, sensitive um, uh, to the personality that is, that is writing yes. these personal uh, lyrics. So anyway, um, we'll just jump into it uh, with their first album, uh, 2011's It Never Goes Out, uh, the first and only album they released under uh, the hotel year before the name change. Uh, it is a pop punk record, basically. It is uh, bursting onto the scene. Um, do how, how do you want to do this? Do you guys want to talk about this record first? Uh, I can uh, just because it's pretty easy. I, like of their records, I think this is the most straightforward and easy to talk about and unpack. For sure. Um, which is not a slight against the record at all. Um, I'm I'm really glad we did this episode because I revisited that, or well, I revisited it recently just so I could you know for this to get my thoughts in order. But I originally heard it after I had first heard Like Home. And I feel like that was a very poor decision on my part. Because when you're getting into a band like this, and especially when they have such a limited amount of records, like, the only thing I could compare it to was Like Home. And, like, Like Home is an album that is in my top five of all time. And I love that album. And I've heard it front to back maybe 40, 50, 60 fucking times. And then I just go back and I listen to this, which is a measurably less um, heady, more direct, though I still maintain it contains a lot of really great poetic lyricism, as all of their records do. Um, I think you actually compared them to Pup yesterday. Yeah, and I'll mention that in my review as well. And, like listening to this album, I'm yeah. struck by how much it sounds like a pup record, even though Pup came later. Um, yeah. So clearly that influence of of even this early early album, which is still like not very well heard, even among people who have heard their other no. um, two records, uh, even though it did get, get reissued after Home came out. Uh, you can sense, uh, I don't know whether specifically it's the influence of, of this specific album, because I'm not as well versed in pop punk specifically as I am in, in emo revival. Uh, so perhaps this album itself is, is indebted in a very strong way to, surely, and, I mean, undeniably it's indebted to a particular scene, but I don't know like whether uh, how much of it the sound is, 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 is I don't know unique from well, other albums in that scene but but it certainly seems that about bands like punk who have pup who have risen to prominence uh more recently kind of are using the same aesthetic that is on this album it's yeah, specifically no, this is, uh, the dream is over i think yeah yeah I, w- I would say this is yeah i mean i i don't want to say the word derivative outright uh because that hasn't more negative connotations it should as we discussed really. on the last episode yeah um but this is not a new sound at all <clears throat> the dog has broken and entered yeah um insert house broken yeah, joke here uh, stop you yeah, yeah. knew it was coming i had to yeah. do it so no you didn't it's not funny yeah and i will say that i do agree this is the the record where they they sound the least kind of like uh unique in their identity as a band compared to the other two but i will say that this is a these songs are really well written like and the oh uh, yeah the performances are really 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 strong they have a like a they're it's immediate they have a really clear um talent for melody uh and for hooks and for memorability like it's a very very immediate album that because it yep. really sticks with you, I think, immediately. Like, uh, even if it takes a couple of lessons to properly like get it, especially if you're approaching it from the perspective of having already heard their later records, which I think most people probably do approach this record from that perspective. So it's fair. Um, but yeah, um, uh, so I'll just I'll just jump into my review, I guess. Um, yeah. And you guys can kind of feed off it, or or go after me, or however however you want to do it. Um, I mean, so this is a fairly easy record to talk about, so I think it's like a, a totally. very casual discussion is befitting of it. So it opens with the song, um, Our Lives Would Make a Sad, Boring Movie, uh, which is uh, melodramatic and ridden with youthful angst. 
uh, expressed through some of the band's most straightforward lyricism, almost to the point of cliche on this song, I think. Um, so it's basically pop punk, you know, with all the character and sense of the grave urgency that comes with the subgenre. Um, musically, there is a great melodic sensibility here, as I already said. Uh, it sets the band apart considerably from a lot of the sort of other bands at the same scene. Um, but knowing what would come next, you th I think you feel on this particular song more potential than anything else. Um, yeah. So it, it's a good song, um, but it's it's a little, I think, stuck in a very particular um, perspective, attitude, lyrically. Whereas I think other songs, even on this record, are, are a little bit more lyrically sophisticated than this one. Um, but it's still very good. Uh, it opens the record really well, and it has some great riff it, riffs in it. Um, the, the record immediately takes a step up, in my opinion, with the song Vacancy, uh, yep. which is a fantastic, uh, raucous shout-along song about depression. Um, fantastic performances on that song. Lonely Hearts Club, the third track, sees front person Christian Holden alternating vocal duty with second singer Zach Shaw, who would leave the band after this album was released. Um, I was going to ask that question just because I I was just like, I forgot how much like dual singing was on this record specifically. Yeah. Like later, it just, it doesn't happen. So I, yeah. I didn't know that. You hear um, backing vocals and fits and starts of, of other vocalist appearances on the other two records, but it's not as like, yeah. there's no vocal sharing like there is here on this album. Um, so Lonely Hearts Club is not one of the strongest songs melodically on the record, but it has plenty of gusto and emotion to keep up the pace. And as I've already said, uh, in parts of this song and on other songs, you can hear shades of, of bands that would follow like Pup. Um, then the record really hits uh, a streak of great songs with yes. uh, an ode to the Night Rats Club, uh, which is just a wonderful, uh, wistful, bittersweet ode to adolescence. Uh, looking back on a perfect time with a sense of sad nostalgia, trying to figure out where everything went wrong. Uh, it builds to this kind of cathartic, melodic, uh, instrumental climax in such a gripping and unsubtle way and it really feels like as you're listening to it an instant classic song of the genre um it's just yep. it's an it's a remarkable arrival um for the band after three pretty good songs uh, to really hit the ground with um a masterpiece track uh, in my opinion something really really special um i mean clearly you feel the same with your vocalizations jake you like the song quite a bit no uh honestly like no let's no <laughs> I hate like, it. let me let me just say this is the, like when we do our top 10 tracks of the band this is going to land very very highly because there is just a it is such a perfect recapturing of what it is to feel like a kid in this very specific context of like the the burgeoning adolescence and like almost a like the whole song is like a coming of age story in like one little like couple minutes span and it's like it's a narrative it's a, there's a story in this song with a logical progression and it like i i am invested in where it goes and it like really took me aback when i came back to it just because it was like i am shocked that this didn't make an impact on me when i listened to it earlier uh and was just like yeah this record's good but like i, I feel it's it's definitely like you said in that a lot of the sounds here are sounds that are very in keeping with the genre, but the fantastic lyricism and like you said, the knack for melody elevates pretty much every song here and probably this one more than the others, even in that case, I'd say. Yeah. yeah it's, um, that, for me, that's what, <clears throat> for me, that's what sets this apart from like the first two pup albums for instance is the really strong focus on melody and melodic hooks which you know pup doesn't not have but they're sort of more based in aggressive stylings there's like more of a hardcore influence there yeah um for pop punk it's nothing even vaguely resembling new or even outside of the norm for that genre um i'm i'm a bit of a closeted pop punk stan uh yep that's it's a discussion for another day well i defer um, to your expertise then okay um the only the only thing that really sets the it never goes out apart from its contemporaries and pop punk is a lot of pop punk is like 
super shiny, I guess. Like, yeah. like story so far records and just bands of that ilk, they usually have really high class production. And uh, this doesn't have that. But what I think it does have in its stead is a lot of character, a lot of really great writing. And uh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I agree. This is very much like a record that is about um, being young and kind of that crossing that threshold from from adolescence to uh, adulthood, a record about having a lot of idealization and a lot of optimism and, and kind of how that how that is affected by the actual reality of, of the, how t- the turmoil of that time uh, and, and what's so beautiful about the, the arc of the three records is the way that the <coughs> poem follows a lot of this up um, uh, uh, very directly. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that arc because I think that the most important thing about this band is how the records have matured and how they all work together as yeah. a, a singular piece, at least in my opinion. Yeah, because like that's, me, a, that's a very illuminating experience when you look at them all as one like whole tapestry. Yeah, like to me, um, it's like a five year thing. Like to me, it never goes out as like captures what it's like to be 15, a home yep. captures what it's like to be 20, and then goodness yep. captures what, I mean, I'm 23, so I don't know yet, but I can imagine goodness would capture what it would like to be like to be like mid 20s, 25. Round up a bit, you're fine. Um, yeah, so it, it yeah, you, you definitely get that kind of progression, which is really nice. Um, it makes this discography as a unit so good to talk about. Um, but yeah, anyway, going back to the yeah. album a bit, because uh, the song after Night Rats Club is actually my favorite song on the record. I really love the song Weathered. Uh, also it's, amazing. It's got this very sweeping and impressive vocal performance and a melody that's just absolutely carried by one of Christian's most unguarded and raw performances. Um, and in the lyrics here, there are shades of relationships that I've experienced in what feel like some of the most personal lines on the album. Uh, release that resonate with a kind of sharp specificity that feels really irretrievably linked to a particular time and place. So you feel that personal aspect in this song in a way that I really, really love. Um, similarly to, to Night Rats, but here it's just like really tapping into a specific thing that I connect with. Um, beautiful song. And then um, you get a, this, a stunning three track run rounded out with I'm Gone. Uh, which is uh, sharply, as as sharply written, nuanced, and affecting a portrait of being a young person in turmoil as I've ever heard. Uh, I don't know if I've ever heard a panic attack described as poetically as it is in this song, in the lines, I'm crashing and walking, I'm crashing and waking. The sun inside my chest is swelling and bursting from this feeling in my fingertips and streams out with breaths deep within my lungs. Zach Shaw uh, does the vocals on this on this song. I think um, I'm, I think he does all the vocals on this song. Maybe Christian's doing some backing vocals, but it's a one of the best vocal performances on the album on this song as well. Like it's, yeah. it's a really nice change of pace vocally, um, and it's just a, a really 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 strong song. Um, yeah, and Stillwater Spectacle continues uh, the more expansive lyricism of the record. It captures the simplistic themes of of, um, teenage and young adult frustration and angst in this very effective and beautiful writing. Um, And title track wraps the record up beautifully with these verses that capture a particular stage in Christian's life where the desire to be a revolutionary uh, collided with their own feelings of personal inadequacy and failure. There's even a spoken word verse on this song that, of all things, reminds me of Slint. Um, that's really neither here nor there, but uh, it was really striking. Uh, ultimately, I wouldn't though, have thought of that. So, ultimately, though, the burning optimism that they that, this, that they can make a difference, that they can make something better for the world, glides above all the doubt in this song. As the record ends with the lines, "I see the world for what I want it to be, and nothing else." Um, so yeah, it's very much a record that epitomizes that that feeling of, of, of youthful optimism, of naivety, you could even say, but also kind of capturing a moment where you're becoming aware of of like the fact that it's optimism, the fact that um, things are going to be a little more complicated and tougher than you might have expected them to be, um, and it's it's really really tuned into that kind of feeling that kind of stage of, of growing up um, that makes it really really affecting for me 
yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it. That's definitely my favorite song on the album. They're yeah. really good at closing tracks. They oh, are. Boy. oh yes, boy, yeah, we got some closing Jesus tracks. Jesus, Christ. Christ. like they're not half bad with album openers either. But no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but Woo. like they, I think. I think the best thing I can say about this album is that it is literally 30 minutes long and it does not manage to really feel slight. I feel like all of the songs here are very well developed and very like fleshed out. I wouldn't like change much about them. And it's sacrifice and musical ambition is made up for with its thematic, lyrical and, and poetic ambition, which I do think it fulfills, especially in the context of this arc i feel like too it's you sort of touched on the, the 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 hopefulness that they managed to hold on to but that said the record is not devoid of the the pessimism inherent with optimism yeah in the context of being a child and you sort of see that grow and flourish into the next record which it's a it's a very strange thing to say but it's an album that is made better by the better album that precedes it not sure how that works, but it's true. Yeah, I get what you mean. And I just want to say one thing as well about like um, the simplicity of the album is that yes, it is fairly instrumentally simplistic, although really, really melodically strong. And this uh, you get, this was really uh, hammered home to me because I stumbled across a video on YouTube and a, of an acoustic uh, solo concert that Christian did, and he and they performed songs from um, all three uh, Hotelier records actually, and including I think the songs, um, a, a few songs from this one, I can't remember which ones, but just hearing them in a stripped down acoustic setting uh, really, really hammered home to me how, how strong these songs were in terms of writing uh, and in terms of that kind of, like I said, that melodic uh, sensibility. Like there's, yeah. there's really like, it's, it's not a slight album, even if it's dwarfed no. a bit by the two that come after it. No, I would, I would agree. Um, I do, I do want to mention briefly that it does uh, kind of bother me that the title track is named title track. Like, <laughs> stop, stop it, fellas. It, yeah, Just, it wasn't. It they, wasn't. They, cool. they go a bit far in places occasionally it with wasn't like cool again. When I Dick love Camp them. did it, and it's still not cool no, here. No. It, the, no. Like I don't feel like the tongue is firmly planted in in the cheek to the point where I could just be like, oh, that's funny. Instead, I just kind of feel like it, it's well, the like the thing is, is that the record title, much. the line the record title comes from is like a direct Smiths reference, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes. it's like clearly they didn't want to um, just like use the full line or or title it because they were I don't know. So yeah. it's like it just didn't feel like they were really fully committing to the bit there. Um, but but you know, it's a small, it's a nitpick. I still no, really yeah, like for the sure. song. Oh um, yeah, so do I. Um, yeah. That does bring me to the point that I think the best thing about this album is the, at times, almost overwhelming sincerity of it. There's just, yeah. the reason its derivativeness doesn't ring hollow at any point is just because it's performed and written with absolute conviction. Yeah. Um, it reminds me most the record I would draw the closest parallel to this is uh, Brand New's Your Favorite Weapon. Um, yeah. Which mm -hmm. is interesting considering the how much I think uh, Home has in place, has bleh, Home has in common with Dejan Tandu in some ways, especially in the terms of progression. Yeah, but you could you could. But you I could, never think about that. You could wow. draw a parallel between those first three brand new albums, progression wise, not necessarily sonically, although there are some sonic parallels, and the, uh, the three albums of the Hotelier as well. Um, yeah, which, yeah. Would, which would mean that their next album is going to be their Daisy, which I would love to hear. <laughs> oh my! God. I don't know if I'm ready for that, man. Uh, <laughs> it is funny though, because they 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 go like through a similar progression. And then they get to goodness, which is like the devil and God's tethered album. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to yeah. that. Oh, I've never heard opposite. a better let's, condensing let's, of that. Let's keep yeah. this moving along. Then, should we do our um, three favorite tracks, then least favorite track in ratings? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jake, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, my three favorite tracks are, I will say, the the title track. 
then weathered and in first place is an ode to the night rats club and uh, i would give this album a a very uh a light eight out of ten. Oh, awesome morgan uh so my favorite tracks are title track vacancy and uh, our lives would make a sad boring movie and my least favorite is probably lonely hearts club um and I am feeling a seven and a half out of ten. Cool. Um, I wish it was, you know, you know, I wish, I wish it was as it kind of suffers a little from just being the album that comes before Home. I think Home does make it better. I agree with Jake's principle in that, but it also, it's a give and take, you know, yeah. with that yeah. relationship, especially having heard Home years before I heard this. Um. But yeah, I do think it's a very strong record, and especially for a debut. Yeah. Oh Which, yeah. It does. I, um, uh, that does remind me. Um, if you all like this record, I would recommend checking out uh, the first and second records by a band called The Dangerous Summer, who you might have heard of. Um, first records called Reach for the Sun, and the second one's called War Paint. Um, this is, I draw this connection partially for sonic reasons but um also most directly from the fact that uh reach for the sun ha also has a song called weathered on it that is right. also <laughs> very good cool. um, well i will make a note yeah. of that yeah awesome yeah i've actually listened to a, an album by that band um there, there was good mother nature that was good that was the last yeah, year i think I, I i think i told you too yeah that is exactly yeah. why very good. Um, so my three favorite tracks on this are Weathered, Ode to the Night Rats Club, and Vacancy. Uh, and I am just going to say I unabashedly love this album. Um, yeah. I really can't poke many holes in it. Like, I, I just the enjoyment of it overcomes pretty much almost any flaws that I can think of. So I'm going to give this album a 9 out of 10. Uh, I really, really adore it. Um, yeah. Hey, I, I have your stuff. favorite weapon at a 10. So I, I sympathize completely. Nice. Okay. Well, let's move swiftly along then. So, uh, three years pass and a name change, uh, or name, along. name alteration. Um, and we get, uh, yeah, as, as I've basically already said, the magnum opus of the emo revival in a lot of ways. Um, uh, the kind of, a record that, uh, I mean, even though the scene certainly continued for yet many years after it came out, it feels very much like the culmination of the scene in a sense, like, uh, or like, I don't know, a point around which the scene uh, orbits. Like, it's just like this hit and it's like, no one was, no one had made a record and no one would go on to make a record that just hits quite like this does. That feels so instantly canonical in the way that this does. Um, not a single wasted second on this album uh and it's all like played with the urgency and the passion of a band that might not ne might not ever get to do it again uh and yeah i uh, i definitely will let you guys um talk about this record first i think okay jake you want to go ahead um you know talking about <laughs> your favorite records is always hard because you always run the risk of either being like a bit too stream of consciousness and rambly or so vague that the appeal is like maybe lost on the people that you might be trying to translate it to. And I did elect not to write anything about home because I'd say this is at least in contention for one of the most immediately emotional, evocative uh, albums I've had in, in my musical experience. I remember listening to it in vivid detail for the first time. I worked at a drugstore and it was an early shift at 6 a.m. in the morning and I had downloaded a shitload of highly rated albums from 2014 onto my phone. And that was the first one I played, no expectations whatsoever. I just found highly rated albums on Sputnik Music and fucking, like I think Morgan might've mentioned them or something, 
Um, so I just it listened is, to that. It is mm. highly likely I did. <laughs> Very. But, yeah. Yeah. And as soon as I just heard it, it was what immediately leaps out at you is Christian's vocals on this album. I didn't probably sell enough how good he is on the first one. That said, here, he has such a and like impassioned delivery of every single fucking syllable on this album. Like the sincerity of the previous album is magnified and made like omnipotent here. And the like just the sense of like the first track, you just sort of feel like you are, I mean, one of the first lines is open the curtains and it feels like you're being overwhelmed by sunlight as this like very bright instrumentation begins. And the way I've always pictured this album like in my head is that like, it always feels like you, now that you're older, have come back to where you used to live and you found it empty. And I feel like every song is finding a different part of your past in that home and reliving it and experiencing it. And the most interesting thing about this record to me in the context of Christian and in the context of both like identity and the perception thereof is how often he uses the pronoun you. And I think that it's interesting to evaluate the songs from multiple perspectives because on so in some cases, it feels like he is describing a character. He's saying you. And then you listen to it again, and it almost feels like he is invoking you, the listener. And then there are other times where it feels like he is singing from a detached point of view of a past version of himself. So there is a weird nexus here of things that could be incredibly personal stories and recollections, like these very vivid recounts of things that happen, like on, I think my favorite song on the record, which is so fucking hard to nail down, but uh, Your Deep Rest, which, you know, haha, it's a pun, kind of, sort of, you're depressed, get it? Because you're sad and you're listening to emo. <laughs> like, but, like funny, like funny haha, or like... <laughs> <laughs> no, like funny, <laughs> uh, but it, it is so cinematic and I find it fascinating too that like this record is only six minutes longer than the previous one and it is it, it has the feeling of of a full like 90 minute film and the songs like I said they were very fully formed on on the last album which I found impressive but here it feels like there is a singular journey on every single track there is a definitive emotional takeaway you can take from these things and whether or not you view it as christian speaking to himself christian speaking to you christian speaking to a character you are always intrinsically involved with the emotional core of the album and there's moments like one of my favorite like song transitions just ever is the fucking immediately electric on fire delivery of life and drag that follows the previous song which like it is literally a break down the door and beat the shit out of you kind of song and he is fucking screaming these yeah. lyrics just absolutely belting them and you are you are forced as he like lyrically flattens you and the the previous album had a, did as tyler said stumble into occasionally being a bit like uh, too entrenched in its influences to the point where it felt like not derivative in an endearing way, but derivative in like a not particularly uh, in interesting or, or emotionally compelling way. And here it's that that is not to be found on a single fucking lyric. I feel like every time I sit down and actually listen to it or I read along with the lyrics, I feel like I'm reading a fucking novel just because of the incredibly detailed and poetic kind of words that he's speaking and delivering through a, a, a bit more of a definitive sound. And I think that's best exemplified on the song Housebroken, which is one of the best songs on the album and one of the band's best songs, which is a weird three-layer metaphor of a song 
that encapsulates why this band is so fucking good. And it's because at the core, this is a song that's written from the perspective of a family dog, or at least someone in remembering and recounting the experiences of a family dog who lived sort of in subjugation to this family, especially uh, in regards to like a male authority figure and people who probably just didn't generally care about this dog and just kind of mistreated him and like fed him shit and hit him. And you know, if you're an animal lover, this is a very fucking hard song to listen to. But then you see it's also about like, it's not just, you know, this memory of this childhood pet and just like expressing regret because there is a point in the song where you sort of see him address the, the, the dog and sort of almost apologize to it. And the most heartbreaking thing that happens in this discography to me is when he confronts the dog and the dog is just like, you know, thanks for apologizing and everything, but like, uh, this is, this is who I am now. This is, this is just the, the person that I am and I have to, or the person, but this is what I live at. This is my life and I wouldn't change it or, or do anything different with it. And it's soul crushing and, also, he's gone on record saying that the song is about, like, the police state, which, if you listen to it with this context, it's pretty fucking, like, it's simultaneously hidden, but you're just kind of like, oh, okay. And I, I think all of these things combine because, like, you don't need this added context for the band. You don't need these things because the core of it and the immediacy of it immediately will leap out at you and it will grab you and it will likely stomp on your heart because this album is sort of the it is the next level it's the progression the rising action of the last one and it is a sort of you know you have that naive optimism on the first one and this feels like accepting the pessimism that came with that, but like the first album is sort of like putting it off and, you know, just shoving all that shit aside and being young and then and, and what it means to, to feel this way. And home is like, that's over. I need to deal with the shit that is in front of me right now. All of these things that I put off and all of these experiences and memories and, and, and trauma that I have to, you know, relive and, and deal with and, and a lot of times you feel like it's sort of repay or just sort of succumbing to the sins of your past in a way, like the, the attitudes that you had, especially on songs like Your Deep Rest. And it culminates in like Dendron, the closing track, is the first song I ever heard from this band because actually now I remember uh, this was how I got into the band. It was at the same time I was listening to lots of music, but it was because Morgan and I, it was right after we had first met and we had made each other a playlist of songs for one another based specifically on our music taste, but just like geared towards something that someone would like. And I just remember, I remember like everything on that fucking playlist, like Titus Andronicus was there, a couple brand new songs were there, but Dendron was the last one. And I remember hearing that completely independently of the album and that song broke me i and it's not even like the saddest song on the album it's just it encapsulates this band so perfectly in one musical stretch and man i i can't tell you how a 36 minute long album is is capable of destroying me like a two and a half hour long epic that you would have to watch or an entire like riveting season of television. There is a, a poignancy here that I've never felt with any other record I've ever fucking listened to. And the, the earnestness and the, especially as I've gotten older and identified with what it means to, to confront all of these problems, these things like depression and anxiety and self-harm and dealing with the fact that you kind of used to be a shitty person and, need to come to terms and, and, and make amends with yourself and the people that may be are still around and it's beautiful and I I love it and it has been with me forever since my musical inception and I will take it with me wherever I go because it is a perfect album and it is a 
fucking experience and I feel bottomless amounts of, of just like, I feel horrible for the people who can't connect with this album because connecting with it on my own terms was one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had with music. So I feel bad in a sense, but it's, it's, it's perfect. I love it. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't feel bad because they're fucking losers. <laughs> well, I don't feel bad for people who can't connect to this album because what a wonderful life they must have. I mean, yeah. honestly, right? It's like, ah, <laughs> no. you haven't been broken like I have. That's the, nice. August, the August we're paradigm. Sub- I was going to say you were subtweeting <laughs> August here, basically. Um, I wasn't, but that's... Mm, Morgan, still. Morgan, would you like to talk about this record yeah. and what it means to you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was either late 2015 or very early 2016 that this kind of came onto my radar. I was like way into brand new then. Uh, like I was not having a good time. It was sophomore year and this was just kind of the music I was listening to almost in exclusivity. Um, so this came onto my radar. It had like a 4.2 on Sputnik music. So I was just like, and to download, thank you. And uh, it's, it's, it introduced me to a whole lot of music that is like this. Uh, pretty Like sort of the, predecessors to this sort of emo revival thing and um for the most part i can say that uh anything i heard after this record for the first time was not as good as this record (laughs) regardless of the influences that it's taken um I, i mean like outside of brand new um i just really haven't heard anything that has struck me in the way every song on this record has and this is like one of the it's a lot like go farther and lightness in the sense that it's just perfectly sequenced and structured um this is again sort of that record's opposite where because that is you know uh grandiose epic and this is decidedly uh not um but I think that makes it all the more compelling for what they're going for. One of the things that I appreciate the most about the Hotelier's discography on whole is their commitment to not having filler. It's like, yeah, our album's yep. nine songs long. We don't need more. And they didn't because it's, it's just perfect. Um, from pretty much the moment the record starts, you're you're just immediately compelled to see what it's going to become you know because it's um like an introduction to the album is so aptly named just because i feel like it's the like prototypical opening track like it's everything that an opening track should be it's intriguing and then it sort of lures you in and it compels you and it's written brilliantly and then it just explodes into what the album is properly going to be. And it reveals itself to you all at once. And then from there, the record just does not stop. Um, the scope of all this rebuilding is just so immediately emotionally intense. Amazing song as well. So oh, good. Yeah. That one. And it's not even, not even one of my favorites. And it floors me every time I listen to this thing. Um, this does bring me to uh, what I think is maybe the most underrated song on the album, which is in Framing. Oh, I love this yeah, song. I'm so glad you see this. The lead guitar, I, you're just like, let's go, let's go. Yeah. I'm ready. And then you're not. No, but like. And it's, it's also just lyrically, easily yeah. one of my favorite songs that they've ever written. The storytelling in that song is just fucking devastating. Yeah, it's just, it. it does what a lot of this album does i think especially in reading some interviews with holden after the fact is it puts you firmly in the place of i mean this is this is just my read of it that's Um, fine it puts you firmly in the place of someone who is very good friends with someone who is having a lot of bad shit happening to them 
which and it's like just the the overwhelming empathy that you end up feeling when those things happen even though it's they're not happening to you is i mean it's a rare thing to see translated in art at all really and um i and i i can't imagine it being done better than it is on this album but even on a completely solely musical level in framing is just oof. like when it gets to the the uh the sort of really like built up part at the end specifically with the line held my breath in the er and it just like you you always think in that moment it's gonna stop building and cut, sort of come back down the way it has from this from earlier on in the song but it just keeps propelling you forward and it's one of my favorite mm. parts of music ever in so anything good. i've ever heard it, it is literally breathtaking honestly like that yeah. moment is so perfectly realized you're just like it's it, you can know how it ends and the anticipation is still fucking agonizing you just, you just your heart leaps up into your throat every time and uh then we're on to your deep rest which has been talked about quite heavily it's not one of my favorite songs on the album uh so that means it's still like a 10 out of 10 song um <laughs> it's just not it's just uh it was the first song i had ever heard from them um and i sort of as such it's still probably the one i've listened to the most and as such this the magic of it has sort of worn off a little bit um Weirdly enough, what it reminds me of these days is Third Eye Blind. Um, I can see that. It's, it, it has that sort of like mid to late 90s alt rock vibe. Like the swinging sensation of the melody. Like it just feels very yeah. 90s. Yeah. It's, it's unlike anything else on the album. Yeah. And I could easily see someone making the case that it kind of stands out against the album and doesn't gel with the rest of it on a purely musical level but then you look at it lyrically in the context of the rest of the album and it's it's sort of like the album's theme and emotions just channeled into one line which is like called in sick from your funeral yeah and just Which, like yeah. the song coming after in framing so in framing is a song about like you've got a you your friend is like some kind of like really awful addiction that's kind of driving them into this downward spiral and there's a suicide attempt in that song and you're kind of cradling them in the hospital and and that's where the song ends and then you go into this song which is like after someone has died and it's like the the jump cut from like the failed suicide attempt where you're where you're um you know comforting this person to all of a sudden uh, whether it's the same person or not but like the implication is that it is they're now dead it's like it's such a devastating bit of sequencing and it's yeah. so powerful you know what it makes me think of is the, the it, again it's a weird comparison but you'll get what i mean is that moment that realization of the two songs intersection in that relationship reminds me of probably my favorite hard cut in all of cinema which is at the very very end of all that jazz where it's oh, this yeah. huge operatic finale and then bam he's dead yeah and you're just stunned and you just sit there and then the rest of the thing it just sort of plays out in front of you. and that's what your like your deep rest is a great song in and of itself but when i listen to it into the context of the album it feels so essential to that journey and that part. Yeah. It is just, oh, God. <sighs> yeah, totally. And, and I feel like if in framing gets at the empathy of these kinds of situations, your deep rest gets at the sort of powerlessness that you feel. I mean, because there's just nothing you can do about anything that your friends are struggling with, you know? Yeah. Um, there's I mean, a great line time. 
there's a great line. Uh, I think the most sort of like encapsulating line on the album is in Your Deep Rest near the end. And it's the line, might have learned how to swim, but never taught how to drown. Um, yeah. I think that basically sums it up. Like you yeah, learn how it. to, you learn how to, how to fucking make it through every single day, but no one ever tells you like, like how to, how to cope with failure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, following with your D, I didn't read, I didn't even intend to go track by track with this, but I guess this is what we're doing now. That's fine. Um, I mean, the flow is inescapable, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, great song. You're depressed. It's dope. It's not one of my favorites on the album, but it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it does happen to be followed by my favorite hotelier track. Just in, across choice. the band discography, great good fucking choice. Pick, which great pick. I, it it seems obvious almost. I mean, it feels like going with Master of Puppets for your favorite Metallica track, <laughs> but like, my God, what the the back half of that song is just one of the most emotionally powerful things I've ever heard in the oh, medium. Totally, totally, and it's. This I I do not care for spoken word in music, um, but the the passage at the end of it is I oh, I yeah. still can't bring myself to skip past it. It feels so <laughs> essential. You yeah, know? yeah. Like the first time I heard that song, I thought that it was kind of like a. a a bit cheaply emotionally manipulative but then i kind of realized like the more that i listened to it that it's actually kind of really really fucking beautiful to go from this kind of like to really like you go from this state throughout the album where you're this kind of um you're growing up you're growing up and you're you're a, you're a, you're an adult and you're you're unable to deal with everything because the world is just kind of pushing you and 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 pulling at you and and, and tearing you apart basically and then it's just kind of like um it just the, the way that it's 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 so simple it's so much simpler when you're like a lot younger and you don't you know have an awareness of of what that's actually like like it's just yeah and it's just so beautifully um that that juxtaposition between like growing up and realizing that you know you don't know how to live and just being really like a a child and just where everything has like a simple uh, answer and a simple solution. Uh, it's just really, really affecting. It's, it's especially yeah. like, you feel like you, that sense that yourself is like departed from your childhood. And this end of the song makes you feel like there is still a connection that you can hold on to and even kind of learn from to yeah. try and, and deal with your problems. And that connection just, appearing at this point at like one of the lower points on the album it feels like you're being tossed a life raft yeah yeah and this song also incidentally has another one of the most devastating devastating lines on the record which is um killing the self as to protect it from harm uh which is uh, a very uh dark but also quite i think insightful way of, of thinking about um what it is like to exist in a suicidal state um, and it's, it gets at something that, that very few people ever really get at uh, when they talk about suicide, which is like actually what, um, you know, the, that sense of like total, I don't know, I can't even really put it into words, but I think you get what I mean. Like it's just, no, it's just all it, there in that line. It's, it is, it's succinct, but I feel like it captures the the, the self-destructive Ouroboros that you are yeah. dealing with when you're in that mindset of just like, if I hurt myself enough, no one else can. And you feel a warped, monstrous sense of security that yeah. you're the one doing the hurting and not someone else. Yeah. That so it, I that's think, it, that's it. and it embodies that in a way I've, maybe one other song on like one other album leaps to mind, but even still this feels so like empathic in how it captures that. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, anyway, Morgan, you were, you were speaking. 
Yeah. Um, uh, cosine, all that. Um, I'm glad you all said that so I didn't have to because I didn't. I don't want to be in my emotions and shit too much. Yeah. Well, let's keep it um, moving as well because we've got quite a bit to yeah. get through. Yeah. Um, but that's followed by the most fucking kick your door down and piss in your garden song, Life and Drag, which is probably like the first sort of emo hardcore song I ever really heard. And as such, when I was 15, 16 years old, I was like, why is he screaming like that? And that was the sound of my Yeah. Now that I'm getting older, I'm like, this is, this is what I feel like every day. I just feel like screaming like this, like 90% of the time. Yeah. People just be doing stupid shit and I'm angry and sad. And it's also just, it's not even, but, (laughs) um, that's not even my favorite aspect of the song. My favorite part of the song is the sort of instrumental bridge between the main melody and the, uh, the uh, Christian screaming life and drag, the the riff that plays there, especially in conjunction with the, you know, overpowering riffs in the rest of the song. It's just, it's also one of my favorite moment, moments on the album. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love it exemplifies it. the musicianship of this band, which we haven't talked enough about, frankly. Like, they can capture emotions and stuff, but this album they go so hard like the drumming on this album specific this Mm. album and goodness have Mm. some fucking elite tier drumming yeah Yeah. i think a great aspect of of life and drag as well is that it really highlights like there is good screaming in in emo and hardcore music and there is ineffective or bad screaming and this is really good screaming because it still manages even though it's incredibly fast and incredibly intense to retain the melodic sense of the song like especially in that I held your hand and rich you will to show disarming uh, while you were a weapon inside yourself inside your body like the the way that that is so intensely delivered but still retains the melody that it's also a melodic switch up in the song as well that's purely conveyed through the screaming uh and it's just very 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 um uh uh sophisticated stuff musically and it's 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 impressive yep um after that, we have Housebroken, which uh, I, I was only privy to the multiple readings of that song very recently. Um, to me, personally, that song has always been uh, very literal uh, because the dog I have grown up with um, and is still with us today, uh, is 15 years old now. Um, Molly or Rose? Mm-hmm rogue uh not in her youth was not a well behaved dog at all um she is the reason that we have hardwood floors in our house because one fourth of july someone was throwing firecrackers and we we were out somewhere and she ripped up the carpet everywhere on everything and it, there's just so many incidents like that where she's destroyed stuff and hurt herself. She still can't really walk right because of something she did trying to get out of a crate while we were gone sometime. Um, and Housebroken always makes me think of the fact that I feel like pretty much any other family would have gotten rid of that dog or just treated it a lot worse than it should have been or you know chained it up outside and fed it because it was necessary and that was it but you know she's always been my dog you know yeah, totally and that's uh nope we're good that's enough about that one yeah uh, uh, yeah, go and please continue. Let's get yeah, um, uh, Discomfort Revisited is probably the most sort of understated 
song on the album. It's very directly melodic and doesn't have the sort of jagged edges as a lot of the album does outside of that. And I feel like it kind of gets lost in the mix when I'm thinking about the songs on the album. Like it never leaps to mind as one of my favorites or anything, but I mean, I still think it is a really good song, especially it's pretty much carried completely by Christian's vocal performances, which I mean, on an album chock full of great vocal performances, this is like top three. Yeah. Um, I think it's fantastic. And uh, Dendron is just uh, one of the best closing tracks of all time on anything. It's the best. It's, I don't even use it's just If you disagree, you're wrong. I'll fight you. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. No, really. it, I mean, yeah, you basically, essentially, everything boils down to exactly what you have said. Uh, I, I have got lots of things to say about um, songs like Discomfort Revisited as well. So I'm ple- I'm gonna I'm looking forward to um, bouncing off of that. But yeah, is there anything else you wanted to add, Morgan? Uh, probably not. This has been in my top twenty albums since I heard it. It's not going anywhere yeah. ever. Um, All right. Well, uh, we've got I will... to stop talking about my favorite albums on here i'm giving <laughs> we, too many tens we'll run out of them eventually uh yeah. i uh i'm gonna jump in then and because i got quite a bit to get through but i want to get through it reasonably quickly um otherwise we don't have time to do the next one just as but first i want to lead off with an extended quote uh from an interview with christian about this album specifically uh and it's about the ways in which this album tie because what i think is the genius of this album uh, beyond the way all of the immediacy of the things that you've already talked about, both of you, is the way that this album ties the personal to the political in a lot of ways. Um, it's a much more mature album, a considerably more mature album than it never goes out. Uh, and and it's, it's got a much wider scope in, term of, in terms of interests. So here's the quote I'm going to read. Uh, quote, it's political in the way that the situations that are talked about in it come back to a political ground. I think most of the struggles people face in their lives are political struggles. So much of what makes up people's lives are governed by the social structure and political structure, really just how power is set up in their world. And I think power is political. It's completely political when I'm talking about someone who took their life because they come from a working class family where alcoholism is more prevalent. If you grow up with alcoholic parents, they're more likely to not be able to face their feelings head on in a way that's healthy. On top of that, that background might teach someone the way to attach themselves to certain people in their life and use them as commodities in their own life instead of treating them as someone who is loved and needed in their life because that's how we're taught to view each other in the world. I think it's all political and I think I see my touch on all the little political aspects in each song. The songs are focused more on personal relationships but while they are personal stories, they all link to these strong political roots that go deeper than who you vote for. Overall, the record is very focused around the life of a suburban teen up until his mid-twenties. It's just mapping out where and why living in suburbia and being sheltered in that sort of environment can lead people to this false world. It's talking about being physically sheltered and the effect of sheltering on people when they face the real world and real dark situations of how world the re- how the world really is. That was the big theme of the album, the effect of that, and maybe a little of how to address that, which is ultimately political to me, unquote. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, of um, sophistic- so what makes this record so brilliant is that as you've all touched on, it's so immediate and it's so tangibly emotionally palpable. The first time you listen to it, the 10th time you listen to it, even just listening to it on a surface level. But the, what makes the Hotelier more than just a great band, but like a really significant mu- band in the, the course of, of recent rock music to me, is how there is so much more that you can get from the music the, the, the further that you dig. It's, it's rewarding on so many different levels. Um, so opening track, uh, an introduction to the album is just a masterclass in, in songwriting. 
uh, the way in which the lines kind of bleed into each other in, in, in the song, like, and uh, you felt blessed to receive their pleasant sound of things that break, make you cringe inside yourself. There's a child counting, counting stars in their timeout. All these lines kind of the first um, word of a new uh, statement or clause kind of uh, is at the, the end of the last one. So it kind of has this um, stream of consciousness feel as you're listening to it. Incredibly um, uh, impressive stuff uh, writing wise. Uh, and it's just an absolutely, absolute belter of a song. Like the amount of times I have just thrown this on and just wailed along to it. I know every single uh, line off by heart I could, I could um, in my car, I've, there've been so many times where I have just literally, um, you just blown the speakers out and just screamed every single line because it's just such a perfect capturing of that frantic feeling. Um, like the world's most poetic autocomplete. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Um, and uh, my, my favorite line uh, in the song is, I can't seem to burn bright enough, which is uh, towards the end of the song, which is, again, such a beautifully like hard-hitting and, and really visceral uh, capturing of the emotional state. Like, um, And it's not the first time as well that... that um, that Christian invokes this imagery of burning and of brightness in their music uh, as a way to kind of um, really hammer home the intensity of an emotional state. He does that, they do that a lot. Uh, and that is my, maybe my favorite instance of that lyrically. Um, and just the, the I, I just slept for years on end and then the move away from the mic to yell fuck. And then the band just comes in at the end. Like that's one of my favorite moments in all of music. Like, this ever. is the slow down there. I just slept for years on it oh, it's so yeah like you good. can just feel the weight of it all coming out of of their voice like it's 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 just insane and then you go into it's like the song just hits up hits the brakes at the very end and then you kind of rattle back in with the scope of all this rebuilding uh and just the intensity in the song the barreling intensity it's a short song but it just never lets up like an introduction to the album starts kind of slow and kind of eases you into it and as the intensity builds but here you're just like being hammered constantly um and ah oh, I, I my one of my favorite moments on the album is just when the when the the tra the backed and tracked vocals come in on and you'd ask me to open your walls to this but i'm scared fingers broken and ill prepared to let this drag out um uh, there's just so many great lines here um i uh and then you get in framing which is just an absolute like morgan's already touched on on how amazing how heartbreaking this song is this song about watching a friend struggle and fall to addiction um detailing a failed suicide attempt and then the um the ride in the ambulance and 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 the way that that um that uh, uh, one particular um a lyrical motif repeats throughout the song this like this um uh when you felt alone when you felt alone and it, it recurs in different contexts and each one is more devastating than the last like that's great songwriting when you can bring back a motif like that and it it, it makes what's happening even more meaningful because of its previous usage um just stunning stuff and and then um you are depressed i've already talked about why i think this is devastating in terms of its album placement um, and I've talked about my favorite line, my learned how to swim, but never taught how to drown. Um, and there are also themes of gender identity on this album as well. Songs like Your Deep Breast and of course, more, more overtly Life and Drag hint that the person these songs are about, uh, whether real or fictionalized, may have been trans. And, um, and Christian Holden themselves has talked about their own conflicted history with gender identity in interviews. Um, and Housebroken kind of already touched on that. So in Christian's uh, words, it's an anti-cop anthem inspired by the teachings of Malcolm X. Um, and Jakey really kind of touched on this. Um, it deals in incredibly sophisticated fashion with the complicated emotions and myriad of both personal and <coughs> political effects that abusive power relationships have, regardless of the context. So obviously you can read it on the surface level as a song about a dog and, and its owner. You can read it on a deeper level as a song about an abusive interpersonal relationship. Uh, but I think, um, I mean, these are both entirely valid uh, readings of the song, but I think the deepest and truest reading of the song, uh, especially when you account for the final verse of the song, which is kind of over, easy to overlook, and even I overlooked it for ages, but it's actually quite revealing. Um, um, 
uh, really touches on that with lines like, um, your bark might seem bad, but I'll show you the scars from when the state sent you over to deliver your teeth to the heels of your kindred, breaking chains from their feet, and then you wipe your hands clean. And then also, one notable thing about this final verse as well is that for the first song, um, is that for the first time, uh, at the very end of the song, the perspective of the dog character, which is second, second person, it's always talking about you, uh, changes to be first person in the last few lines. Uh, try to muzzle me up, I'll lash out, I'll bite back and keep my options open for fear of becoming housebroken. So that's quite um, a meaningful moment, I think. So it's about basically the abusive, reliant relationship between police and in institutional policing systems and the public. Um, Discomfort Revisited is about encouraging someone who is dependent on you to stand on their own two feet and helping them become less terrified of the world and terrified of taking care of themselves. There is an incredible emotional development in this song, as by the conclusion of the song, the subject has developed from that initial state of total harmful reliance to finally stepping out and being able to leave them behind. Though it's unclear at the end whether this leaving behind is of the, the singer of the song or of life in general. Uh, wish you could stay, wish you felt the same way, a line directed at the singer. Uh, by the end of the song becomes wish I could stay, wish I felt the same way. So there's this progression from I need you to be here to uh, I, I no longer need you, uh, I need to move on. And it's really emotional and it really, really gets me every time I listen to this song. Um, and then you have dendron, uh, which in its title, the Greek word for tree, uh, brings in a recurring theme on this album, the imagery and language of trees to the forefront. So there's a lot of references throughout this album to this notion of things being passed down. So family trees, genealogy, things being hereditary or genetic. And that's continued here with lines about following our fathers down the drain. And, and further references tying this to aging through the tree metaphor with lines like count my rings to see how many winters I've been stuck here underground. Uh, the political and philosophical roots of the album are touched on in some of the final lines too, uh, with the lines, I cut my arm off at the bone in solidarity. Capital teaches that there's less when you shear. Uh, so that's this notion of wanting to reduce someone's pain by inflicting some pain on yourself by redistributing that pain. But of course, all that would do is create two painful situations instead of one. So it's the ultimate linking of the personal and the political that the album has built to. Uh, and it just has this really, really gut-wrenching effect by the end of the song. Um, so it's an, it's an immaculate, um, sophisticated, uh, beautiful album that can be appreciated on a lot of different levels uh, and is just... Uh, one of the most impressive uh, works of this whole kind of subgenre of, of, of emo revival music. And, and I adore it. And it's perfect. Nothing more to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into our favorite tracks then and, and ratings. I uh, wonder what the ratings are going to be. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> Jake, what are your three favorite tracks? My three favorite tracks are, let's see, it. first favorite is Your Deep Rest, uh, two is House Broken, and three is Dendron. And for least favorite tracks, uh, no. And I give this a, uh, I mean, in the most emphatic of 10 out of 10s I can yeah. possibly fucking give. Totally fair. And Morgan, your three favorite tracks? Uh, my three favorites are uh, Among the Wildflowers, uh, in framing and housebroken, and my least favorite, I will refer to you to Jake's least favorite. Yeah. Um, and my rating is uh, ten. Yep. Uh, my three favorite tracks are, oh gosh, actually this is really tough. So uh, my nine favorite tracks. Are... <laughs> my my favorite track is in the introduction to the album, and then in framing, and then discomfort revisited. So those are my three favorites. Um, and yeah, it's a ten out of ten, obviously. Okay, so uh, let's move on to goodness. So I want to give a little bit of context here. So um, there was a three-year gap between Never Goes Out and Home, and there was about a two-year gap between um, Home and Goodness. And I believe, like, in terms of actual recording, there was, the gap was even less than that. Um, so, and it feels very much as though Home 
gave the band the freedom um, to make goodness, which uh, to me, I think is um, the true pinnacle of their arc and the true truest kind of realization of, of Christian's writing and of the band's sound and basically of everything. Um, uh, I don't know whether I should do my like extended essay first or whether I should do it after you guys have um, spoken. So I'll let you decide. My thoughts on the album are relatively brief. Um, so, as are mine. Okay. We should probably do that first then. All right, sure. And you guys can, after I've done my extended thing, you can kind of tell yes. me if, if it, if what you think, basically. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So, so Morgan, you, you, me, you can. yeah, yeah. I'm eating. You go ahead. I'm about done. Oh, okay. So well. It's it's interesting just because goodness was one of those albums I just I just never got around to and I'm I think it was mainly because back when I got into the band I just sort of like as Morgan said I share his thoughts like I'm not a big fan of spoken word and if you're not a big fan of spoken word the first song on this album is a bit off putting. So I just kind of heard this and was like, oh, huh. And then I just didn't ever listen to the rest of it for whatever reason. And uh, I'm... It, it, it quickly developed a reputation as well as like, oh, like they, they were uh, completely like, the, in terms of dealing with the issue of following up an album as beloved as home, they just completely went in a different direction, uh, which I guess you can debate the truthfulness of that as a statement. But uh, it did develop the reputation that it was like nothing like home. So if you want more home, don't come here. It, basically, I would it, not. That, say that that both is and isn't true in some ways. Yeah, I agree. But I, I like it's a very limited view of the album. But going back and listening to it, it is at least from like a purely musical standpoint, I am in awe of this album because it takes all of these sensibilities because like, I cannot imagine making an album further from where they started in terms of it never goes out. Like this album has like, I don't think there's a song on here that I would say is like a more traditional emo revival song, like the structures, the production choices, like th this album at times can invoke like a post-punk vibe. It's, it's bizarre. And pretty much every choice bizarrely works and i think it is a a very nuanced album and i i will admit you have to meet it halfway there is stuff like the spoken word passages of which there are multiple and like and th this is also features some of the band's best songwriting but it also features some of its most impenetrable songwriting, which is not inherently bad. In, it's just that this album is not, it, it is nowhere near as immediate as the previous two. Not even fucking close. You need to sit with this album and you need to, you need to develop a relationship with it. You need to have a conversation with it. And I feel like they're, they're, they're the attempts here, the, the goal, is to end up being something that sort of transcends where home left off. Something that, like, you, you've completed part of the journey and this stage is sort of, you've moved on through all the difficult parts uh, of your life and you, you have to push past and it's sort of the difficulty of, of actualization I think the running theme through all three of these albums is empathy. And it's apparent that I feel like Christian has like bottomless amounts of it for the human experience, especially on here. And the choices of like some vocals being mixed strangely, some songs being uh, just structured in a very strange way. It's, it's a little bit longer than the other two albums. It is inherently more difficult, but like if you sit down and interrogate it and you are receptive to its lyrics, I promise you this has the potential 
to be an experience as emotionally affecting as something like home. That said, I am not even close to done unpacking this shit. I've listened to it like five times and each time I listen to it, I like it more. That said, there are parts of it. There are parts of the spoken words where like something like, I, I almost don't want to ruin it for myself and look up an interpretation of some of the lyrics or of some of the spoken word stuff because I want it naturally to come to me because what I have unlocked of this is like fascinating and, and beautiful and, and poignant and strange. And I feel like it's almost like on the cusp of being like something genre transcendent, something <laughs> defining, something experimental and weird and i love that this band went in that direction because who the fuck else has so i respect this album slightly more than i like it but i like it a very great deal i just want to interject to say um as well that my feelings on this album which you both know uh i don't know that i really loved it as much as i did until i had spent maybe a, a year or two with it like uh, not of constant listening either. Like I listened to it when it came out a few times and then put it on the shelf, didn't come back to it for a long time. And then I would just come back to it every now and then. And eventually uh, over a long period of time, it warmed up to me uh, and, and it gradually grew to the, to the point where it is for me today. It was never one of those like go farther in lightnesses where I hear it and I'm like instant canon. It took, it took a lot of time. Uh, I will say though, it never felt like work uh, learning to love oh. this album. It just felt like um, the familiarity I, I had with it to the point where just I knew what, I, what to expect in terms of what it was going to sound like and what the songs were. It, it just made everything a lot more rewarding. Uh, and just there's a real catharsis to a lot of this um, that continues a similar kind of in a similar vein from home, but it's in a much richer way. Um, like home is a record that I listen to when I'm feeling like shit and I want to I want to, um, you know, commiserate with someone in there or like, or like be felt, but I can listen to this album when I'm in any state of mind and it will uh, amplify it in a way that's healthy for me. Um, like, yeah, it's just, this is an all purpose album for me. I, I think that's like beautifully indicative of what I said. And in many ways, I have to thank you because your love and appreciation for the record was what made me so willing to engage with it and to come back to it and to see the rewards that it yields. And it really does. I, I love like, and I don't want to give the impression that this album is just nothing but like this, like this weird, 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 avant, weird, avant garde songs on here, like, like um, piano player or or um, fucking uh, soft animal, which like they are so they're at least not maybe not all of them, but parts of it are so immediate and so arresting, and not in how like blatantly emotional they are, but just how like I'd almost call this record spiritual. I don't know how exactly I can explain that in a way that makes sense beyond I, telling I, you to go I listen to it. I consider this a very spiritual album and I'll be explaining that. Don't worry. It's yeah, meditative. It, it feels spiritual in the way it connects to nature and yeah. the, the <clears throat> world. Yeah. And the way that Holden specifically views the world. Yeah. The, I will in a say very like, beautiful the, way. What, what does kind of make this record like, not impenetrable is the fact that it has a very strong melodic core in the same way that home does it just employs yes. a little more uh meditative qualities and repetition within songs a little more than that album which was constantly kind of shifting within itself does this is a record that is content at times to stay in in a single place for a while and then move on with the next song um but it does still have the, the really strong immediacy of performance and melody that home has so in yeah. one word sustain yeah yeah that's mm. that's it <sighs> yeah I did it um Morgan, we can, what we can go home now <laughs> uh yeah um for the longest time i have with this record what i refer to now as the get to heaven paradigm where i was just like how in the hell could they make anything that could be as close to the quality of this record? 
in this instance, that record being home, like no place sure. is there. And, um, I have to stop doing that because it works out great every damn time. Yeah. Um, at a certain point, you just have to trust an artist to carry you through, you know, when you vibe with their stuff so much, you kind of just meet have them to halfway, place, meet them halfway and realize that not everything's going to be as immediate as the thing that brought you to them in the first place. <clears throat> And sort of take a step back and let it hit you in the, all the different ways that it can. And okay. as such, the, my journey with this record has been admittedly fairly short. And much like Jake, I am still in the process of unpacking it. Um, but this, I think, from just my emotional connection that has been built over years with home, aside this is every bit as good as home um oh, yes fuck yes you have no idea how good it is to hear another human being say that <laughs> my, I also, my let, let me say also i totally agree with that i was focused on the parts that made it different but yeah in no, terms sure. of like outright quality yeah absolutely fucking lutely it's as yeah. good yeah I, and I, it feels so strange to me in retrospect because initially one of the things that turned me off from listening to it was everyone saying how different it was and how mu how much of a strange follow-up it was and and I've, also I, and also the I, cover art as well is, is interesting yeah that was odd well um yeah. <laughs> um but naked yes yeah that is um, that is exactly <laughs> what it is i like the song oh wait that doesn't really work uh <sighs> the hell was i talking about Oh God! Your difficulty uh, getting into this initially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was um, everybody talking about how different this was from home, and I I think that is so bizarre in retrospect because I think this is like home's twin. I think they both sonically and thematically, this feels like everything that home isn't. It's it's mirror image. Um, I already used the tethered metaphor once, so we won't do that. Um, but I feel like it can best be summed up in Holden talking about the album in an interview. It's like, this is not home number two because we can't live in anguish our whole life. Yeah. And to me, this album feels like coming to grips with the fact that like you... I Just speaking from my own personal point of view, there's a a tendency to hold on to all of the bad feelings that you have like there there's value in them and as such you sort of internalize them and have them with you all the time but really all that does once you're done processing those feelings is just you know it's cutting off your nose to spite your face it yeah. just you end up noseless and you look funny um it just does it just doesn't help anything you can't live in anguish your whole life because that isn't living yeah and you sort of have to take the world as it is which is a beautiful horrific nightmare wonderland and you just you make the best of it because what the hell else are you going to do? Totally. Well and said. I think, I'm sure that Tyler is going to go much more in depth than I will on these songs. Probably. And in, I, I'm probably going to go much more in depth than is even necessary, but fuck it. Yeah, we're, we're here. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're queer. Uh, well, that is, the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I, the, the, <laughs> My issue with, I brought up my issue with spoken word passages uh, as a sort of foreshadowing for this album is, and I can comment now and say that they don't bother me in the slightest here. Um, mostly just because I think Holden is such a good writer. And oh, yeah. also because they're, they're crafted and structured in such a way that it never feels like 
they it's like a placeholder for anything that all feels like it's necessary and mm. sort of it gets at what the album is getting at and it also just gives you moments to breathe and process in ways i appreciate um mm. yeah there's not really a thing i would change about this record Maybe i am um, well yeah Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to clarify one thing, which is that uh, I get where you're meaning, but you may be misremembering. There's only one actual passage of spoken word on this album, which is the opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are yeah. acoustic interludes, uh, which I, would... I think serve the same function in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, that's why, yeah, that's why I referred to them in the, in the same way, as I just yeah. didn't, I wasn't thinking about clarifying that those are different things. Yeah. Because the only spoken word yeah. passage is the opening track. Yeah. 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 Um, they all have the same those, vibe. Those those breathers that those interludes give you, yeah. and also are, um, a fun little uh, factoid is that the titles of the interludes, which are coordinates, are uh, lead to. Places, I knew you were going to elaborate on this. So uh, lead to places that are of great significance uh, to Holden personally. So the the coordinates for the opening title track uh, reference uh, Sabaday Falls in Vermont, which is where he swam as a kid and almost drowned. Uh, he was underwater for four minutes according to an interview. Oh, wow. So that is what that is in reference to. And the other two are references to other places that are of, of personal significance. But anyway, uh, I'll get into my review now. Uh, and I want to lead off my review, <laughs> fittingly for this album, by reading a poem. Uh, not one that I wrote, don't worry. A real poem by a real poet. Um, uh, you are a real poet. Shut your poor mouth. I'm going to read a very famous poem, actually, uh, called Wild Geese by a poet named Mary Oliver, who is referenced on this album. Uh, and I believe that the poem is quite important uh, to the record, and it's mentioned in the... Uh, yeah, anyway, so I'm just going to read it. It's, you might have heard it before. It's pretty well known. But here it is. Uh, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. Calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So that poem I, is, yeah. Sorry, I just, I very briefly interject with, I Please. had to actively restrain myself from going, ha, I like the song when you said soft animal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a beautiful poem by Mary Oliver, who has mentioned, um, and I think it's good to keep in the back of your mind while you're thinking about this album. Uh, it is. So I will also lead off with another quote from Christian about the record. Quote, on home, I feel like there's this sort of big internal self-searching aspect and self-deconstruction self of how we're built and how we interact with each other. And if we can actually truly care for one another. And then goodness is this record about how to relearn love for yourself in the world and in the face of all this dark shit, kind of. It's this record about losing love in the sense that you think that love is something that exists forever or this idea that things can exist forever and then understanding that they don't. Unquote. So as uh, Goodness Part 2, the first main track on the record begins, we're thrown into a world that is stripped of all its artificial noise. Um, the album begins uh, with a spoken word passage and notably with silence as well. There, is, there are periods of, not long periods, but brief periods of silence between a lot of the tracks here and at the start of a lot of the tracks here. Uh, and then the opening words of the first main song, there is a kind and immediate hushing. There is a setting enveloped in cold. These first lines are about the place, um, and it is only once the place is established that people appear in the next lines, withered down to our basic components, we are naked, at rest, and alone. Uh, and there's one line uh, as well, in these days we will wear the same blanket, in these days we feel nothing at all. And that moves us forward 
and anchors us in the present. So we've established this beginning, this emptiness, this nothingness, and then we're pulled into the present into where we're wearing the same blanket and, and, and numbed by the world. And as well, I would also note that there's a field recording of rain underneath the second verse on the song that becomes slightly distorted and st staticky before falling away. That adds quite a bit um, to the song as well. Uh, one recurring theme throughout this record is the notion of permanence. So this idea of whether or not people and things last forever in any sense. There are multiple references to encounters with animals where uh, Christian feels as though they recognize in that animal someone they once knew who has since passed on. In this track, Goodness Part 2, there are the lines, a little bird from the side of the sidewalks sings me hymnals of comfort and pain, says, give me you all disarmed and uncertain, and I promise that I'll do the same. And it sounded like something you'd say. So there's the touch of the surreal here as well, but it's all kind of deeply spiritual. Um, not spiritual in the sense of religion, but in the sense that um, you can feel something else, a resonance, an affinity uh, in the mundane. Um, and there's also uh, a callback with this line, with this line referencing a bird in the first main track, speaking to him or to them. There's it references as well the fact that in the first track of Home, there is also a bird speaking to a Christian, telling them to tear the buildings down, whereas here the bird is, is singing hymnals of comfort and pain. So there's that um, immediate counterpoint uh, introduced here where, where that basically sums up the, the different emotional states uh, of these two records. So um, one way of looking at this kind of spiritual aspect is, is like to say that when all you have known for an extended period of time is pain and suffering, then even just the absence of that, a single moment of clarity where you can appreciate the world for what it is outside of you becomes really profound. Uh, I think that's captured on the song. Uh, piano player is about not treating the things in your life as though they will last forever, in Christian's words and also a meditation on your own permanence or impermanence. And it does this from the perspective of an elderly woman reflecting on her life. Uh, it's unclear whether this is her perspective that's in the song or Holden's perspective of her. Uh, could potentially be the grandmother that is later referenced more directly on a later song. Um, the sustain, so stay wordplay is really um, nice here as the song touches on this idea of treasuring individual moments in life and clinging to them, wanting to live inside of them. But also this notion that because of how you know, flawed and vulnerable our memory is, that these moments might change and morph into something different over time, even without our awareness. Just look at how evocatively and beautifully the notion of a treasured memory is captured in these lines. Remembered loves and morning suns until her woven heart was sung, her fingers dropped like falling rain, the entire room awash with the sustain. Christian's poetry here is so developed, so lyrical and dense that passing a lot of these details and figuring out my interpretation of what they mean has taken a long time, a lot of listens, but it's always been really rich and rewarding for me. And, and the moment I kind of realized that this was about the song was about memories and 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 the you know the fractious and vulnerable but so vitally important to us nature of memories just kind of like it was like being hit with a truck you know it just like completely added new layers to the song and then you get the song two deliverances uh, which deals with a fractious relationship between christian and a person whom it is strongly implied as religious uh, and on a deeper level, it's also a meditation slash reckoning with uh, Christian's own relationship with faith. Um, there are a lot of lines that suggest Christian is talking about a friend, but they could also be interpreted as Christian begging for answers from some kind of God as well, or at least crying out into the emptiness to see what happens. And this is kind of captured in the lines, if I want them to, will they speak to me soon in a language ripe for my listening when the harsh sun breaks in your stained glass eyes, the refracted light keeps glistening. There's a sense of hesitance, of guilt about the notion of expecting religion or spirituality to serve as some kind of personal cure. As in the lines, now I'm swimming through the nothingness and the absolute, but I couldn't ask this of you, I couldn't ask that. 
Equally, you can cast aside this interpretation and see the song more as a plead to connect with a friend or a lover who is growing distant in some sense and is beyond their saving, or at least than an acknowledgement that it is not Christian's responsibility to save them. There are regular and continual asides and references to aspects of nature or the world around us, as though Christian is singing something deeply personal, and then their attention drifts to something in the environment, like the way that light reflects, reflects through stained glass, or the gleam of blue from a cold night's moon, or seeing stars in the night sky as pinhole lights. These regular diversions suggest that where on home the personal was regularly tied to the political, here the personal was being tied to something grander, something that goes beyond people, to the universe itself or at least to an acknowledgement of our own insignificance in a world that beyond us is so beautiful and busy. The horrible weight of existence that bogged down the protagonists in the songs on home is shared here as you focus instead on the thrill and joy of being present to witness and feel the wonder of everything. Settle the Scar is the oldest song on the album, dating back to 2013, but updated here. It's one of the more musically unusual on the record with an off-kilter melody and drum beat that eventually settles into a straightforward rhythm. And then later in the song, there's a fractious breakdown in which the drums glitch out before coming in again lower in the mix and then pounding through to the song's climax. Uh, contextually, the song continues in the vein of two deliverances, examining the narrator's relationship with their friends, feelings of loss and impermanence and confronting regrets as well. It's wistful, it's affecting, and it marks a nice emotional cap on the first half of the album. Opening Mail from My Grandmother is a percussionless ballad which sees Holden visiting uh, their grandmother in a nursery home and helping her to reminisce on the few fractured memories she still has, tying observations about her aging to his own thoughts about his own permanence and his, his relationship to nature. So again, it's continuing that theme of like, of uh, memories and the senses in which we exist, um, you know, outside of ourselves as memories, as things that we've done, as things that have happened, uh, as, as touched on in Piano Player and in this song. Um, soft Animal. I've got a lot to say about the song Soft Animal. I won't make any bones about it. This is the greatest song the Hotelier have ever written, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it, it's close with another song, but at the end of the day, I think this one's always going to come out on top, and I'll explain why. Um, it's one of the songs on the record that most directly deals with this notion of impermanence, of the extent to which we continue to exist in some form after we die, whether it's in the literal form of reincarnation or in a form of just like the things that we leave behind, the memories we leave behind for other people. Um, in terms of the reincarnation aspect, uh, Christian has implied that the encounter with the deer that's talked about in the song reflects a feeling of recognition of a, a loved one that has passed when you, in, in observing a grazing fawn, uh, potentially even their own grandmother, if you want to see it as a continuation of the previous track. Uh, the song also references the poet Mary Oliver, both by name in the lyrics and also in the title, which references that poem Wild Geese that I just read. Um, and the sight of the deer in this song in initiates an existential crisis of sorts with uh, Christian pleading, make me feel alive, make me feel that all my selves align and make me feel that there is a God sometimes. There is this direct and striking confrontation with the limits of existence and the search for meaning and unity between yourself um, uh, and the world around you. Um, to me, this song is about experiencing a kind of divine moment of unity with the world, where you feel like entirely and completely a part of and connected to everything. And how that experience makes you feel more alive than any other moment in your life that's led to it. All of this, simply from lying in bed and seeing a deer through the window, and recognizing in it somehow someone that you once knew who no longer exists or seemingly doesn't exist in the form that you once knew. I guess it's like analogous to the experience of seeing, seeing a ghost, if that's something that either of you have ever experienced. Imagine that moment, like take a second and imagine that moment where someone who's been gone from your life, dead 
or gone in some other sense, uh, suddenly appears again to you, whether in a form you recognize or not. Imagine how you would feel in that moment. It might not even be seeing someone who's gone. It might not even be seeing someone gone. It might just be like having a buried memory of someone suddenly flood back to you in a really overwhelming way. Um, and keep that feeling in your mind as you listen to these lines. In attempting to keep you to stay, I am raising no alarm. It is just us two alone. Then I feel a sigh of wind, your raising eyes, the rolling fog that lets you hide, and I can hear the rustling as you go, go slow. You can imagine that fog as a literal barrier that this figure is disappearing into, or you can see it as the fog of a fading memory. And I can hear the rustling as you go. This line which Christian repeats throughout the song refers to that feeling of impending loss that washes over you as the person or the memory fades. And all you can do as you realize that it's going is just big, that it will go slowly. And then the lines, I want to read some more lines. You camouflaged or clearly seen and nameless in the in-between. Uh, and I can hear the rustling as you go. The firing of rifles off, the echo hits you hard enough, and I can hear the rustling as you go. A soft and skittish self inside shines golden, opal, chrysolite, and I can feel the rustling as you go. A mob of voices harmonize and tell me that you're not alive, but I can feel the rustling as you go. Note the way that the repeated line changes here. Firstly, it's, and I can hear the rustling as you go, an acknowledgement. Then it's, and I can feel the rustling as you go, the same acknowledgement, but more emotional on a deeper sensory level. And finally, at the very end, it becomes, but I can feel the rustling as you go, a kind of defiant repudiation. This rustling is not just something that's signifying an impending loss anymore but it's been recontextualized as a final signifier that something had been there, that it was and is real for you, and that it meant something. These three lines, hearing the loss, feeling the loss, and then shifting the focus from the loss to the realness of the lost person's presence to you, is as perfect and beautiful an encapsulation of the experience of grief and of grieving as I've ever heard in a song. Sorry, I went, like, put. I, I went really no. in depth there, but like that song is so it, it, special to me. Absolutely a song that is worth it. That's a top three hotelier song for me. If, if I might <clears throat> build off of that a little bit. Sure. Um, this is the, the deer, you know, stopping by, you know, it just the, a sort of experience with a deer in the context of grieving is, is something that I find comes up a lot in art in general. Yeah. Um, the two most specific examples that come to mind immediately for me are both in stand by me where yep. Gordy's sitting by the train tracks and the deer comes up and, uh, and I know Tyler is not a fan of this film, so I know exactly be, what you're about to say. <laughs> a little grossed out by the uh, the parallel, but three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Um, yeah, sure. Which is, that's my favorite scene in that film. And totally. um, it, it, it's, it, it feel like it's a tried and true metaphor sort of parallel that, it has never lost its luster in the various ways that it's been incorporated yeah. across art. Totally. Um, I don't know. There's something both comforting and deeply sad about it. And I yeah. think is just infinitely compelling. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's in the, like it's in, in that it is definitive proof that it exists, but also definitive proof that it has changed in a way that you can't like it is both 
comforting and, and warm, but also a, a reminder that things weren't as they always were. Yeah. To being a different form. Yeah. I love that. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to just keep going uh, whirlwind through this. Um, so the next song, um, Sun, is the longest track on the record. Uh, and I think it's one of the most direct and straightforward embraces of the theme of nature as an extension of oneself. And this notion that death is not an ending, but simply a transition into nature, uh, a shedding of form into the ether. Uh, in a lot of ways, it reminds me of uh, a movie by the filmmaker Michelangelo Framentino called Le Quattro Volti, uh, or the four times in Italian, which examines the same idea in a very direct and beautiful way of these kind of like different forms of living. But anyway, in this song, uh, the physical form is like one with the natural environment. And the iconography of the sun is used repeatedly to underline this. Uh, you and I'd escape the night and call it summering. I'd hold your rays for, and ride for days while you spin endlessly. Here the singer is musing about a specific relationship, uh, maybe to another person, with another person to whom they're close. Um, the slow build from a rattling central core in the second half of the track to this explosive, hollering climax, where the only constant throughout this progression is the mantra-like repetition of the title, underlines this increasing closeness to and then eventual fusion with nature. Like you could even see it as like a passage into death. Um, uh, it's also a song about loss, uh, with the subject of the song, a person very close to the narrator, discussed as metaphorically represented by the sun. You and me, twin fire machines, expending all our energy. A song about feeling so intensely, whether negative or positive, that you feel the burning energy of the sun inside you. I still feel like I haven't really passed this song completely, but it's amazing and and that gets to one or two interpretations of of i think dozens you could apply to this song um uh, and then the song you in this light uh seems to be about confronting someone who's struggling with a feeling of being stuck in some kind of horrible poisonous state uh, whether it's being afraid to move past a traumatic past or just being concerned about the inevitability of death uh, the narrator comes across them wrapped in the bedding in a light slight in a, you in this light, in a light meaning in a state that feels foreign and frightening to them. You in this state feels like a thing I can't remember. You in this light is unusual to me. But they then confront these questions together. What if we don't? What if we never know? As they dance in private with the concept of never and eventually move through the pain of the uncertainty to a more positive place of acceptance in the lines Clutching you close, your body felt like December. Shook awake early from the rocks of your tremors. Tracing my thumb over the miles of your memory. Now a bit brighter with a smile and a laughter. Finally, the backing vocals at the conclusion of the song provide a sense of closure as this person, perhaps represented by the secondary vocalist who's not Christian in the song, is finally able to move past the state of mind that had been crippling them. Coming around again, making some space to mend, gaining the strength to stand, feeling the love again. It's like um, a sequel of sorts to Discomfort Revisited, where that song is about a person in a really toxic state of dependence on someone who eventually gradually learns um, to survive on their own. And this is kind of an extension of that, but it's even more, the ending is less ambiguous and it's even cl more clearly optimistic and happy. Uh, and then you have the closing track, End of Real. Uh, which <sighs> the goat the goat like we all like um we all like like the hotel you were like with home like we just dropped an out al an album with one of the greatest closing tracks you'll ever hear and then with goodness they're like uh bitch you thought because this song is like somehow i'm gonna let you better. finish Hogan but... said said hold my beer to themselves like like ah uh, that line that's repeated in the song i don't know what i want 
what I want's where I've been. Like that's such a resonant line to me and, and I hope I can explain yeah. why. Um, but actually, like, I think lyrically, this is quite an oblique and abstract song, maybe the one, the most abstract lyrically on the whole record. It actually takes a fair amount of close examination and thought to pass in terms of the lyrics, even though like musically it's quite um, conventional and, and very easy to listen to. Um, Christian has said that one aspect of the lyricism they're particularly satisfied with across this record is how abstract the poetry is because they love to see how different fans interpret it and how it resonates. Though there are definitely a number of certain themes Christian has spoken about that the record touches on frequently that I've talked about, uh, ultimately a lot of the meanings I've discussed are really just my own interpretation and, and this particular track is no exception. Uh, and I'm not going to break it down line by line because I think that would be tedious, but I'll try to broadly discuss what I think the song is about to me and the resonance it has for me personally. So it's basically a summary of the many different ideas to me that the album has touched on. Finding a personal and tangible resonance with nature as an extension of yourself. A feeling of connection with another person that's so strong they basically feel like an extension of you. Grappling with the inevitable end of your conscious existence. Recognizing a part of you or a person close to you in some kind of alternate form or trace. And most, perhaps most integrally, vowing to continue in every sense and refusing to let yourself stop you from continuing. Standing on the edge of life, not knowing what you want, before stepping back from the edge to embrace where you've been, i.e. the choice to continue. So ultimately, this is a song about living as an act of defiance, of the sight of you brimming, meaning the sight of you full of life, full of hope, full of energy, full in a sense, because that's what brimming means, and using that energy to help you along. Christian has described goodness as a Taoist love record, and I'm not that familiar with Taoism, so I'm not going to go into it. But in terms of the love aspect, uh, it seems this is the love aspect. The, the learning to accept that it is okay to fall back on someone or something that can share their energy with you to keep you going. And that defiance of living, that defiance of, of continuing, is beautifully captured in the final moments of the record. These resonant drum hits that just beat out into the silence. To me, these drum hits represent heartbeats that when all the noise of life has just faded into the background, you still keep your heart beating. You still keep going. You still keep living, beating out into the silence and leaving your mark on it, which is why the fact that those drums are reverbed so heavily is important as well. It's that resonance of the sound carrying out into the silence, leaving your mark, leaving your impression, turning your void into a canvas and a possibility into a life. And that's what goodness is about to me. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good thing your mic didn't cut out like Forrest Gump then. <laughs> I hope it didn't. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Okay, you good, came good, through good, quite good, clearly, good, thankfully. Good, 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 I was good. able to hear um, every word. Yeah. Oh, I kept it together somehow. Holy shit. That's I was going to say, props to you for it. You, you did that. You walked that fucking tightrope so I well was, that whole time. I was just like locked into my script, man. So I'm so glad I wrote this down because this would not have been as clear if I didn't. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of yeah flesh this out a little bit more and publish it somewhere actually so that other people can read it because I'm really proud of it. Oh, fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. We can put that in the description of that this video. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I, I hope I've explained why this is my favorite album of all time, like in a way that like you, you, you can understand why it would be the one for me. Like it's just so much in it that, that I keep um I keep learning from, that I keep discovering, that I that keeps like keeping me going at a certain point like like home the catharsis of home is great and it and it really like i love that i love diving into that and feeling the pain and then and and getting strength from the catharsis but this is the one that i listen to when i really need to keep like to keep going to keep um uh, moving because it tells me how to do that uh in words but also not in words like it just i listen to it and i know I just know that I'll be okay. And that's like the greatest thing that I could ever hope for a piece of art to give me is, is, is that. Um, so yeah.
It is interesting to me that I think both Tyler and my favorite album more or less has the same message. Yeah. That being say yes to life. Totally. Yeah. To me, and, and I, I like to think of it in the way that like, it's also my favorite album, which I guess I haven't disclosed on the podcast in so many words, but the final track of, of Punishers, I know the end. And I feel like that is a miniature version of the exact same thing that you two were talking about. Totally. I, yeah. I, you said that and I saw it instantly. So yeah, completely. Um, An embrace of what is next. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm sorry to rush this along, but uh, I'm kind of running out of time. So I think we should kind of maybe wrap this up. A no, bit. I think we, uh, I think we locked that in. Yeah. Let's go to favorite tracks. Um, Jake, you go first. We'll just keep you in the same order we've done. Uh, my favorite tracks, and this was harder than I thought it would be, but my favorite tracks are Sun, Piano Player, and Soft Animal. Cool. Uh, and I would give, I, I would like to keep in mind that this started off for me as like a hard seven. Now it is like a very emphatic eight and a half out of ten. I'll take it. And I do expect that to go up in the future, so... Make of that what you will. Look, you don't have to do anything for me. I'm just, I like hearing. Exactly oh, no, it's not on behalf feeling. of you. I'm just telling, it, it speaks to the, the fluidity of my relationship with this album for people who, like, I, I want your love and my love to be an incentive for people to try to, to give this a go. Yeah, totally. Morgan, your three favorite tracks. Uh, my three favorites are End of Real. Uh, piano player and soft animal and um this is the least favorite tracks uh, uh, no uh, not no. necessary not necessary <laughs> uh and i i don't want to go jump the gun and give this a 10 because things inevitably will change one way or another from where i am right now yeah. So I'm a, I'm a feeling a, a 9.5 out of 10. Beautiful. Love to Loves see to it. See it. <laughs> so my three favorite tracks are Soft Animal, End of Real, and Piano Player. And this gets uh, 100 out of 10. Um, yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, and so let's, uh, before we wrap up, let's do our t- 10 favorite Hotelier songs. If you have lists of yeah. those ready um, by any chance. I do. I do. Okay. So Jake, you go first. All right. Uh, honorable mentions, I have two. They are Sun and End of Real. Broke my heart that I couldn't include them on the list proper. Yeah, that's fair. Number 10, Among the Wildflowers. Nine, Life and Drag. Eight is Weathered. Seven is In Framing. Six is Dendron. Five is Piano Player. Four is Housebroken. Three is Soft Animal. Two is your deep rest, and number one is an ode to the Night Rats Club. Wonderful, mm. beautiful. I would not have picked that number one, but it makes total sense. I told you that I had a strange choice for that, but oh, great, great, Morgan. So it is. Your turn. All right, at ten we have vacancy. At nine, an intro to the album. Eight, soft animal. Seven, housebroken. Six, title track. Five, dendron. Four piano player, three in framing, two end of reel, and one among the wildflowers. Fantastic! That end of reel at two, that I felt that. That's where, <laughs> from, that's where it is for me as well. Solidarity. Um, so my top ten is uh, ten is two deliverances, nine is an ode to the Night Rats Club, three at uh, eight three eight is uh, sun, seven is weathered. Six is Discomfort Revisited. Five is In Framing. Four is Piano Player. Three is An Introduction to the Album. Two is End of Real. And one is Soft Animal. And that's how it be. This band is good. They're very good. Um, And you should listen to them if you haven't. Listen to goodness. Listen to home. Yes, please, please listen to goodness. Like home gets its due, goodness does not. Yeah, it needs more love. It really oh, does. Yes, and I believe on our next uh, B sides, we're going to be 
uh, tackling the discography of Metallica. Oh my God, is it really Fuck. time for that? Well, two weeks, we'll be recording it two weeks from now, or roughly two weeks from now, depending on how things go. Um, but yeah, that should be fun. To, I have to listen to Load. <laughs> you have to speak about Load. It's a Load, all right. <laughs> oh, I can speak about it. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll leave it to you guys, um, you know, how you, how you want to prepare. I can't believe anyway, this show has listeners, gone on long enough to do that. Listeners, look forward to that and let us know what your favorite Hotelier album is. Let us know what your favorite Hotelier songs are and let us know what you think of our reviews and interpretations of the albums in the comment section below. We love to actually hear other people's perspectives. Um, yes. And yeah, thank you for tuning in. Yeah. And see us on another episode where we talk about normal releases. Normal. Rock, uh, London. Rock, Rock on Chicago. Rock on Chicago. Um, uh, Toys R Us <laughs> where a kid can be a kid <laughs> <laughs>